So with the Bible reading, we started, we uh, read 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to end the sermon with 2 Peter chapter 2. But just starting off there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, these are the qualifications that are given to, a, to a, the office of a bishop, someone that, that's desiring to be the bishop. But let's just pick it up from verse number 3. It says, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy for filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. So the title of the sermon tonight is Bible Qualifications for a Bishop, Part 2. Now, if you're wondering why, we pre- why am I preaching on this today, well, I was, I was going to preach on the fruits of the Spirit. I was going to get on to the next one, uh, but my flight was delayed in Sydney. We had, uh, we had really bad fog in, in the Sydney in the morning, so the flights were already delayed. And then once the fog started to clear up, they had computer problems. So uh, my flight was delayed, like, I think over four hours. So I got home about three o'clock, and I just didn't have, I just, at the, at the um, airport, I just wasn't, I didn't have the mental ability to, put, to work on my sermon. So this is something that I had prepared for the men's leadership class, a sermon that I had prepared then, but I ran out of time on Friday to get onto it. So we, we covered some other topics during that day. So um, I'm going to preach on Bible qualifications, qualifications of a bishop, part two. And during those four hours while I was there in the airport, I became aware, well, I've become aware in the last few weeks of a book, a novel that's been, that's been written by an IFB pastor, and the book is called uh, Wolves Among Lambs, Amongst Lambs, Wolves Amongst Lambs, and it's written by an independent fundamental Baptist pastor, all right? So I thought, well, I'll use my time. I, I, I downloaded the book on Kindle. I was reading it in the airport, and um, it's basically about um, sexual abuse that happens in, in churches at large, but this time it's come from an IFB perspective. So, uh, you know, things that took place within the IFB world. And this pastor himself, he was, uh, you know, taken advantage of as a young man. You know, he had, he had two occasions, two personal experiences of dealing with um, homosexuals, you know, especially one that was a senior pastor in a church. And, and uh, you know, he was made a youth leader. And, you know, he was, he was basically... Trying, you know, that, that senior pastor was just trying to get him to commit sexual acts with him, you know, and, and it really opened up my eyes. And, um, you know, first of all, as, as I was reading that, I was very saddened, saddened for the victims, saddened for the victims of this sexual abuse, and, but also just, just, just uh, so angry, you know, so fired up that this can be taking place in churches. How, you know, families, you know, innocent, innocent children, the reason why it's called wolves amongst lambs and not wolves among sheep is because obviously the lambs are a baby sheep, a little little baby sheep. And these predators are going into churches, yes, sometimes taking advantage of the adults, but quite often also taking advantage of little children, young men, young women. And it just made me disgusted reading that book. I mean, it's, it's a good book. It, it, you know, I would, I would consider actually purchasing that book for our church. Um, and then you guys maybe can just read it, borrow it, kind of like a library system or something like that. I think it would open our eyes for, for people that have not experienced that or not aware of that within the IFB circles themselves. You know, but as I was reading that book, you know, I, came to, I came to realize just how important the qualifications are for a bishop. You know, we, we read these qualifications and you, know, you might think we've already covered these things, but it's so important. You know? And I, I realized just and I was, as I was reading that book as well, you saw that many times people are made pastors. I mean, this pastor himself that wrote this book, he was made a youth pastor as a single man, unmarried, no children, you know, made the youth pastor. We see the qualifications here. The husband of one wife already preached on that when we went through the part one qualifications. But yeah, it's just like they completely dismiss it. And then when these perverts are called out, you know, that some of these pastors, some of these IP pastors would rally around the, the perpetrator rather than the victim. And they would rather protect You know, the the man with that name, that degree, with that reputation, that Bible college, that preacher, they would rather protect that person than protect the victim. You know, and it just made me sick. And I realized, you know, before I ordain anyone, you know, you better make sure, you know, if if you want to be ordained, these qualifications have to be met, okay? I mean, 100%, you know, at least these qualifications, that's a minimal requirement, have to be met. And I promise you, as the pastor of this church, as the one that holds the office of a bishop here, that I would not ordain anyone unless I'm 100% sure that person matches up to the qualifications that's in this list. You know, we see the damage that's happening in these old IFB, old IF, I'll use that term, the old IFB churches, all right? But you know what? 
perversion takes place even in what you would call the new IFB churches. We've already seen a man of God, a pastor. You know, it was around Christmas time when, when he fell and, and what, you know, was found out to be sleeping around with prostitutes and all this kind of stuff. Look, it can happen to anyone, all right? We, we, you know, we shouldn't... And here's the other thing. We need to be, be careful. You know, we shouldn't paint with a broad brush. You know, these are, there are independent churches. There are good pastors out there that are aware of these dangers, that are aware of these qualifications, are doing the best they can to follow after the Lord. We shouldn't paint them with a broad brush, okay? But we need to be aware that even within the circle of our churches, you know, if we're not following the ordination process properly, and if we're not aware of these things, we're opening up for predators to come into this church and hurt the lambs, to hurt the little baby sheep. So we're going to focus just basically on 1 Timothy chapter, verse, chapter 3, verse 3. So we'll start it off there. It says, not given to wine. So the one qualification for a pastor or for a bishop is someone that is not given to wine. Now, a lot of questions gets asked about what does it mean to be not given to wine? If you just drop down to verse number three, verse number three, the Bible, uh, sorry, verse number eight, verse number eight. Well, now it's not talking about the bishop, but about the deacon. It says, likewise, must the deacons, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not given to much wine. So when we saw the bishop, it said not given to wine. And then when we see the deacon here, it says not given to much wine. So this opens up a few questions. And there's basically three ways to answer this. Why does one say not given to wine literally at all and one saying not given to much wine? All right. So let me go through the three ways you can kind of interpret this. Number one, well, first of all, let me explain something very quickly. I do believe this is talking about alcoholic wine. That's, that's my personal belief. I know there are others that, that do not believe this is about alcoholic wine, but this is about um, over-drinking grape juice. But I do believe this is about alcohol, alcohol here. So with that in mind, there's three ways to interpret this. Number one, that the pastor or the bishop is not allowed to drink any wine at all, but the deacon, he can have a little wine, right? The deacon have a little wine because it says not to be given to much wine for the deacon. All right, maybe, maybe the argument there is that the deacon doesn't have to make as many decisions as the pastor does, so he's allowed a little bit of wine. You know, he, he's imp- you know his, his decision-making can be impaired a little bit, whereas the pastor, no, not at all, you know. Now, the problem with that, with the people that kind of take this position, well, they don't even take this position. What they do is they, they look at the deacon there, with not, with, uh, they can't have much wine, and then they themselves think, well, I can't, you know, then I shouldn't be given too much wine. Meaning they end up drinking a little wine themselves. They end up drinking a little alcohol themselves. That's how they end up interpreting that. That's the second way of interpreting it. So that's one way, all right? One way. Deacon can't have, or deacon ha- can have a little bit of alcohol, but the pastor cannot. The other way to interpret this is to say, well, surely not given to wine is the same as not given to much wine. And that's my position. My position is these two things are identical. And the reason for that, if you look at verse number 8 again, it says, likewise must the deacons be so-and-so. So when it says likewise, it's saying we're well, in the same manner. Just like the, the de- just like the bishops, the deacons also have to be the same. So what that, then how we can interpret that is not given to wine equals not given to much wine. But then there's two thoughts of that, right? And I, I kind of just mentioned one. Well, if, they're, if they're saying the same thing, which one do we go with? Do we go with the not given too much wine? So you can, the deacon can have a little bit of wine. That means if it's the same, then the pastor can also have a little wine. Is that what he means? Or do we take the approach where the pastor is not to be given to any wine, all right? And so likewise, the deacon ought to not, not to be given to any wine. And I think it's important to look at the, 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 the order that it's given to us, right? So it starts with the pastor not given to wine, okay, and any wine, and no alcohol, and then likewise, the deacon should not be given too much wine. And so if it's following the same thought, then the much wine should, would be sort of subject unto the, unto the wine, okay? So that's my position. Neither the pastors nor the deacons should be given to any... In fact, none of you should be given to alcohol, but especially the pastors, especially the deacons, these people that have positions of authority or leadership within the church. But also notice, it's not just the wine, it's not given to wine, okay? Now think about that term, not given to. You know what that means? If you're given to something, I mean, think of the reprobates. What does it say in Romans 1? 
that they've been given over to a reprobate mind. You know what that means? That reprobate or, the, or that, that person is subject un, under that reprobate mind. That reprobate mind basically is controlling them in, in the way they behave and act, okay? It's the same kind of idea. Someone that's given to wine is someone that is subject to that wine. They've been given over to it. They're addicted to that substance. The wine controls their life. Their addiction controls their life, you know? And I, I would say that a pastor, it's not just the wine, the alcohol here, but it's the addiction. You know, I think someone that has an addictive personality, you know, for things that are harmful, for things, things that waste your time, should not be a pastor. Anyone that's been, can, that is given over to something, because usually when you're given over to that, it rules your life, okay? And you see the drunkards, you know, it's like they get up, they, they, they've got to have a drink. You know, you, you see people on drugs, or it's not so much here on the Sunshine Coast, but definitely down in Sydney, people asking, yeah, have, you got, have you got a bit of change? You know, have you got a couple of dollars? And you know, they're just going around asking, you know, that, oh, I've, you know, I've got to catch a bus home or something, you know? My car's broken down, I've got to catch a bus home. But you know, they're just collecting as much money as they can, then they're going to, into that pub and drinking themselves silly, or, or buying some drugs, and, and you know, it, it controls their life. The whole life is given over to that addiction, you know? So, you know, as pastors, we need to make sure that person does not have an addictive personality to harmful things. I mean, I've heard someone once say that they're addicted to the ministry of, that God has given them, you know? I mean, that's a good thing to be addicted to, right? But usually the word addictive is in, in a negative sense, being given over to this, all right? Now, why is this important? Why is it so important that pastors should not be given to anyone or to any alcohol? I mean, there's a few reasons why. I'll get you guys to turn to... Where can I get to turn to? Go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Just keep your finger there. And I've covered this before. You guys know where I stand if you've been in this church long enough. But it's good to go over it once again anyway, isn't it? So, you know, I'm, I'm going to read to you from... Well, actually, no, let's read Revelation 1, 6 together. Let's read it. It says, And have made us kings and priests unto God and His Father... To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And it's such an amazing thing, spiritually speaking. If you're saved, God has made you kings and priests unto God and His Father. What a title. You're royalty. Okay? You're royalty in the eyes of God if you've been saved. He's made you kings and priests. Why is that important? Because as kings, we need to, we need to take control of our lives. We shouldn't let sin control our lives. We've been given the power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost in us to walk righteously, to walk in His ways, to make good decisions for our lives, for, for our own lives, for our, our, our spouse, our family, our children. You know, and for me, as the pastor of this church, decisions to make for this church. You know, I've been given that authority, but we're also made priests. Okay, Because you know, back in the Old Testament days, for someone to, to worship the Lord or to be able to offer a sacrifice, they had to go through the Levitical priesthood, you know, the Old Testament Israel. They had to go into the temple and offer their sacrifices. And, and that's where they would worship. Quite often they worship in the temple. They would go to the priests. But you know what? We're made priests, meaning we have direct access to God. Praise God that, you know, we've been given that office as, as priests and kings in the spiritual sense. And so I'm going to read to you from Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8. And this is when the Lord made, uh, you know, instituted the, the priesthood. He, he talks to Aaron, the first high priest. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, this is Leviticus 10, 8, if you want the reference. But you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it. He says to Aaron, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink. Thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye enter into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. So you see, God told um, uh, Aaron and the, and the priests that they, would not, they were not allowed to drink wine. You say, why is that? Were they independent Baptists? Is that why? They were independent fundamental Baptists? I, I, I guess they kind of were, right? But that's not why. Because he says this in verse 10, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. You see, it's very easy to mix up the holy and the unholy when you're in the flesh, and especially when you're under the influence of alcohol. It's easy to mess up your minds. You know, this is why, you know, it's, it's a crime to drink and drive because you don't have good judgment. You, can, you don't have control. You, you can't uh, analyze the situation like when you're sober, 
Okay? But the instruction to the priest where they were not to, they were not allowed to drink wine. And of course, you guys know Proverbs 31 verse 4, the words of, of uh, Lemuel's mother, but under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It says, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Hey, do you want to pervert the judgments? Do you want to pervert your judgments? If you do, then alcohol is a good way to do it, all right? But no, the instruction is, as kings, as priests in the Old Testament, they were not to drink alcohol because they had to make judgment calls. They had to make decisions. And so do you think that requirement would be any less for a bishop, for a pastor of a church? Absolutely. You know, you're, you're making significant decisions, you know, it's, it's not, I don't make decisions just for me and my family. You know, every decision I make for this church affects everyone in this church, affects every family. You know, it could potentially affect future generations to come. If I make a mess of things, we can really mess up people's spiritual lives, you know. And this is what I saw in this book, We you know, Wolves Amongst Lambs, is these stupid pastors, these foolish bishops, these false prophets, you know, destroying the lives of the lambs in the church. And these people just being, just, just losing interest in the church, just losing interest in the faith, being affected, and, and the, the kind of damage it can do, you know? So, you know, the reason we're not to be given to wine, first of all, is because it impairs your judgment. It impairs your judgment. The next thing there in that qualification list was 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. It said, uh, no striker, no striker. So, Actually, before I get to no striker, if, if, I'm going to go to not a brawler. Because I've, I've commonly heard people say, well, not a brawler is the same as no striker. It kind of is the same. But there's, there's a bit of a difference there, okay? So I'm going to go with not a brawler first. What does it mean to be a brawler? If you got involved in a brawl, what does that mean? You'll probably say, I got involved in a fist fight, you know, a punch up, you know? So a, a brawler, by definition, is a fighter or someone who participates in brawls. Okay, a fighter or someone that participates in brawls. Now, the reason why a pastor or a bishop is not to be a brawler is because a brawler is someone that lacks self-control. You know, they, they get into a position where they're brawling, where, where they get into physical alterations, you know, but that's not the way a pastor should be. He should, you know, if, the, if there's a situation at hand, he should be able to control it. You know, should, instead of losing control, you know, instead of losing control and causing damage, he ought to have self-control. If you guys can turn to, you guys are in Tim, Timothy, aren't you? First Timothy. I'll get you to turn to First Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six. And I'm going to read to you from Titus chapter three, verse one. Titus chapter three, verse one. It says, "Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates." to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle. So here we see the difference between a brawler and someone that is not a brawler, okay? Let me read it again, verse 2. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but... So how should we be instead of being a brawler? But gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Gentle meek to all men, okay? Now, do you think if, you, if you're someone that's gentle and meek, there's a big difference, by the way, between meekness and weakness, all right? Huge difference, huge difference. Someone that's weak isn't even meek. They, they don't understand the meaning of it. To be meek, to be gentle, is to, is to be able to control a situation, is to be able to diffuse, you know, tense problems or, or put out fires and and, 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 and give people kind of that benefit of the doubt for a little while. Let them answer. You know, let people respond and, and, and be soft on them until the time is where this person's guilty. Then it's time to be hard on that person, okay? But the brawler will lose control. They won't allow people to defend themselves or, or uh, to answer. You know, that they'll just make false accusations, throw things their way, and get into those fist fights. It's, you know, you're required to be gentle with people. You guys in First Timothy chapter 6. Now, the reason I wanted to turn you there is because 1 Timothy is where we see the qualifications of a bishop, which said no brawlers, okay? But you'll say, well, aren't we supposed to fight for things? Absolutely. It's in the same book. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, 
But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So what does it mean here? We ought to fight the fight of faith, right? I mean, we're not, we're not, we shouldn't be brawlers. So what's the fight of faith? It's a spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual fight. In fact, it's defined there for us. Fight the good fight of faith. And then it puts it in another way. Lay hold on eternal life. You see, the fight that we need to fight of faith is eternity, is the gospel, it's salvation. We need to be fighting for the gospel that God has given us. Because these false prophets, they're preaching another gospel, they preach another Jesus, they have another spirit, and that's the fight that we need to fight. Hey, listen, how many churches on the Sunshine Coast are preaching the, the sound gospel that you know? And then how many churches are preaching another gospel? It's time for us to fight. How do we fight? We go out there, we preach the gospel to the community, okay? We, we, we preach against these false prophets. We, we preach against these false gospels. That's the fight of faith that we need to be fighting. And of course, the fight that we need to uh, fight as we walk after the Lord. So, you know, we need to fight the fights of faith, but not the carnal fights of the flesh. That's not the calling, especially as a pastor, as a bishop. You know, if, if you lose control and you get into fist fights, you're not, you're, oh well, you need to work on that if you want to be a pastor. Otherwise, that's, that's definitely a quality or, or a qualification that someone must have. You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy, you guys, you can turn if you want, 2 Timothy chapter 4, you're not far away. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. I want you to see how else does Paul describe this fight of faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he says, I have fought a good fight. How? How did you? F-? He goes here, I have finished my course. This is how he's fought the good fight. He says, the task that God has given me, I finished it. I've completed what God has asked of me. Can you say that about yourself? That you've completed the task that God has given you in life? If you're still living, there's still something to complete. That's the fight of faith. That's the good fight. He says, I finished my course. I have kept the faith. What he's saying is, I'm near the end of my life and I'm still faithful. I'm, I still have faith in the same Lord Jesus Christ. I'm still trying to walk the, the, the path of faith. And he says, this is how I fought the good fight. He's remained faithful to the end of his life. Okay? So that's how, we, how else we can fight. And then it says in verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto, the, unto all them also that love his appearing. Hey, do you want this crown of righteousness? You've got to fight the good fight, the fight of faith. Okay, be faithful to the end and love in his appearing. I mean, you know, loving the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back and, you know, and, and having that hope of glory in you. So don't be a brawler. Let me go on to the striker. What's the difference with the striker? Um, if you guys can go to Jeremiah chapter 20, please. Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Now, a striker is someone that attacks viciously. You know, someone that causes harm or even death. You know, and I'm, I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. It says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And this, this is the famous passage we all know. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and dangerous as serpents. No, it says, and harmless as doves. Harmless as doves. Hey, the serpents are wise. They know how to catch their prey. Okay? They're very crafty. Hey, we're required to be wise. You know, be smart. You know, know the Bible, know the answers that might come your way. You know, be able to stand up for the truth. But at the same time, you know, yes, be wise as serpents, but God does not ask us to be dangerous like serpents. And what do the serpents do when they attack? They strike their prey. They inject their venom. They destroy that prey. They kill that prey and they devour that prey. That's not the requirement. That's not what God asks from us. He wants us to be harmless as doves. 
okay? Harmless as doves. So how do we protect ourselves? By being wise as serpents, okay? So when the harm comes, we, we get away from that danger, okay? So what I want to say here, guys, is that pastors, bishops that strike, there, there are a lot of pastors that hurt their congregation, okay? And now look, it, it's good to rebuke. We're called to do that. We're called to, to uh, preach against sin, maybe even your own personal sins. And you're going to be discouraged when you realize the sinful state that I'm in. You're going to be upset when I call out your sin. You know, you're going to be discouraged. But the point of doing that is to edify you. It's not to destroy you. And it's not to make you feel, uh, you know, like a failure. Because we all struggle with the flesh. It's about edifying the believers. But see, many pastors can strike and you'll see, because when they strike, the sheep are scattered. The sheep leave the church. Now look, there's going to be times when people just leave the church over the preaching of God's Word. But make sure they don't leave because you've attacked them, because you've destroyed them, you know, that you've demoralized them. No, that's not the way a pastor should be. You guys are in Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 21. The Bible says, For the pastors are become brutish. What does it mean to be brutish? Without sense, stupid. God says these pastors are stupid. They don't have common sense and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Does this guy sound like a striker? Absolutely. He causes damage to his flock. He causes damage to his congregation. And the flocks here are scattered. You know, they're no longer gathered together. They're no longer attending church. They're being scattered, spread abroad. Go to Jeremiah chapter 23, please. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1. The Bible says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. You know, I, found, I find it very precious that we can be in church. I find, you know, each one of you, your, each of your souls for me is very precious. You know, and when, when people come to our church and visit us, I feel like they're just part of our church immediately. You know, because I want the sheep gathered. You know, I want the sheep together in the pastures that God will lead us in, you know? It's not because I, I want to be this, this dictator in control of things. You know, my heart for coming to the Sunshine Coast was knowing there were believers scattered abroad, you know, to be brought together to fellowship for the Lord. You know, the whole thing with Sydney, was that my plan? The Second Sydney Church? No, once again, I saw sheep scattered. My heart was moved with compassion for these people, you know, to bring them back together, you know, not to, not to cause harm, not to strike, not to cause, you know, damage these people. You know, and, and there is some damage sometimes, you know. And, and when people have been damaged, you need to be aware of that and make sure that you edify them, you, 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 you help them grow and mature in the Lord and they would establish themselves strong upon the rock of the Word of God. And I'm going to read to you now from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It says here, and he gave some, look at this, just, just pay attention, Ephesians 4, 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? Why does God give people spiritual leadership? For the perfecting of the saints. That's why. To make you whole, to make you complete, to make you strong. The perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. Ministry. My job is to minister, to be a servant, to serve you. That's my job. When I prepare a sermon, when I preach, I'm serving you. You know, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, you're the body of Christ. I mean, how precious is the body of Christ? You know, the, the, that he died, he, you know, on his body, he bore the sins of the world. He was broken for us, right? In that, and then resurrected. And he calls this church his body. It's the same. That's how he feels. The way he sees his own body and the works that he did in his body is how he sees the local church. You know, we're a beautiful group of people in the eyes of God, the body of Christ here. And it's our jobs to perfect, edify, strengthen the saints, minister to the saints, not to strike, not to damage, not to scatter the sheep. Those people are unqualified to be pastors. 
let's keep going there. In the next qualification was greedy, right? Not given. Um, oh, sorry. How did it, how was it worded in First Timothy three three? It said, uh, "Not greedy of filthy lucre." Now, filthy lucre, as you guys know, or you should know, is money, wealth, possessions. Not greedy for filthy lucre. Now, I'll get you to turn to uh, Titus chapter one, verse seven. Titus chapter one. Now, the reason why it's a good place to turn is because in Titus chapter one, we also have a list of qualifications of a bishop, but he puts it in a slightly different way. Let's have a look at this again. Titus chapter one, verse seven. It says, for a bishop must be blameless and the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. Remember that, that not given to? There it is repeated again, not given to wine, no striker. But now look how he puts it here. Not given to filthy lucre. It doesn't mean to be given over to something again. Is that it has power over you, right? Just like given to wine, you, you, you allow alcohol to have power over you. But well, the same thing here with filthy lucre, that some people make themselves pastors, they, they take on leadership roles for money, for filthy lucre. And it, it says to not to be given to that, okay? Meaning that you do things for money. You don't do it to minister to the saints. You're not doing it to edify the body of Christ. You're doing it to be wealthy, to get paid. And of course, the TV evangelists, you guys are aware of that. A lot of the Pentecostal churches preaching that uh, pr uh, prosperity gospel. You know, we know, but you know, even within our own churches, even within our own circles, within the IFB churches, there are pastors that are greedy for filthy lucre. You know, I, I, it's, it's easy to, to poke fun at the charismatics, the Pentecostals. It's easy. But you know what? We need to look at our own house. Our, you know, judgment begins in the house of God. You know, it can happen here. It can happen within our church. And, you know, this is an area that we need to overcome. It's, it's very easy to desire wealth. You know, I, find, I think it's because the whole world just prioritizes wealth above all things. It's easy to fall into that trap, you know. And, but one thing I, I learned, I, I've, I've had times when I've had a lot of money, and I've had times when I've had very little money. And I found that when I had a lot of money, that's when I was, I had more fears, right? Because the more wealth you have, the more things you have, the more fearful you are of losing those things. And the more wealth you have, the more unsatisfied you become because it's like, it's never enough. The more you have, you desire more, you know? And this is why it's so important that the bishop is not chasing after money. Yeah, we need money. We need to provide. We need to pay for ourselves and our families and the things that we do. That's important. That's important. In fact, the Bible teaches that pastors ought to be paid, all right? But this is someone that's being given over to that. You know, the, the, the power, you know, that they're under the, the power of money, they're chasing that wealth. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it, it, it said greedy, okay? They have a greed for money, greedy. And uh, I'm just going to read to you from, if you guys can, let's see, where can you turn to? You guys can turn to Isaiah 56, please. Isaiah 56, Isaiah 56. And I'm going to read to you from uh, um, Proverbs 15, verse 27. It says, he that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, okay? But he that hateth gifts shall live. So you see, if you become greet, greedy of gain, greedy of filthy lucre, it says he troubles his own house. It hurts your own family. You're going to be prioritizing money and wealth over your, your spouse, over your children. You know, yeah, you, you might be extremely wealthy, but you're going to have a destroyed house. We've seen that. I've seen, how many times have we seen that? That people have chased after money, you know, successful career, and yet the whole family has fallen apart, you know? But then it says, but he that hateth gifts shall live. There's nothing wrong with gifts. <laughs> Salvation was that free gift that God has given us. But the idea there with someone that's greedy, you know, um, or someone that is not greedy, he ought to hate gifts. So let's think about this as a pastor, you know? So or, or just anybody, you know, when you go to work, the, the reason you get paid is because you've earned that, right? You've done the hours, you've done the work, and so you've earned that paid. It, it's not a gift, it's a reward. But you see, the greedy wants gifts, meaning they're chasing after things without earning it. You know, without having to, without having to work toward it, they still want to get paid. They still want to have that wealth, you know, and, and the pleasures of life, if you will. Go to Isaiah 56 verse 10. Isaiah 56, verse 10. And here we're talking about watchmen. But you see, one of the roles of a pastor, of a bishop, is to be a watchman, 
to watch over the souls of the flock that God has given you, right? It says here in Isaiah 56 verse 10, it says, His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleep in, lying down, love into slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. That's, you know, you've got to learn to be content with what God has given you. You need to learn to be content with, with, the, with the income that you have. If it provides all your needs, praise God. Be happy in that. Praise God. You know, rejoice that God has given you what you need in life. But you see, the greedy here can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. Is that the way a pastor should be? Looking after his own gain? No, the pastor ought to be looking for the gain of the church, of the congregation. Verse 12, come ye, say they, I will fetch wine. Look at this. And we will fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow shall be this day and much more abundant. It's interesting how, how here in Isaiah, it just, they just put it together there, right? The greed, you know, and then what do they do? Because they have excess. They've they got so much now. They're chasing after money. What do they spend it on? On alcohol, on booze. They get drunk, you know? And so you see how these things come together. You know, a, a pastor ought not to be this way. A pastor should have, you know, I think if you've had difficulties with alcohol or, or chasing after wealth and you have a desire to be a pastor, this is an area you really need to work on, like really hard because, you know, like for me, I've never, I've never cared for alcohol. You know, I've never really chased money. You know, I mean, I've had times when I had wealth, but it's not because I really chased it. It's just because I worked hard and I just got it. Praise God, you know. But it's not something that I really found great comfort in or pleasure in. And so it's not an area that I really need to struggle in. But, you know, if you've struggled with alcohol or money in the past, then, you know, this is an area you definitely need to keep an eye on for. You know, it's not saying that you're disqualified. It's just that maybe that was in the past. You've worked on that. Now you've overcome that, but you need to be aware as a pastor because you're going to handle sometimes large amounts of money, you know, things like that. You need to be careful that you have self-control. All right, the next one of the qualifications of, the, of being a bishop, it said, but patient, patient. All right, now, I don't have a lot to say here, but just very quickly, you guys know the parable of the sower, okay, the parable of the sower. And it said in, in Luke 8.15, just, just the, the, the seed that fell on the good ground, it said, but that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. How are we to win souls? How are we to bring fruit with patience? Okay, patience. Being a fruitful soul winner requires patience. And you know, one of the requirements, you know, that we should have, you know, with desire to be a pastor or deacon is to see souls saved, you know, either yourself going out there, but also facilitating and sending the church to get out there, people to get out there and rejoice in the souls that are one, rejoice in the seed that's been planted. Now, I, I, I'm over the moon. I'm over the moon that every week seed is being planted, not just here, but also down in Sydney, you know. Praise God for that. It's, it's awesome. But we need to be patient, you know, because, yeah, I mean, this is about soul winning here, but also being patient with the church. You know, sometimes a church might not grow or, or be fruitful in that sense as much as you would like it to be. Maybe you, you'd want it to grow faster or you'd want the offerings to be more because, you know, there's projects to, to do and things to be paid for. But you need to be patient. And that's why I keep saying, I mean, you're probably sick of me saying it, but organic growth. Just, just let things grow organically. Just do what God has asked you to do. Let God grow, you know, be, be, you know work according, according to God's timing and be patient about that. You know, God's timing is the best. God's timing is always on time, and it's always the best way to go. And once, once, once more, you know, teaching people takes time. And if you've been a parent, you know that teaching your children takes time. You know, you don't just tell them one thing and then they've learned it forever. You've got to repeat it over and over again. And that's why you need to be patient as a pastor as well. You know, the church may not grow as fast as you. I'm not talking about in numbers. I'm talking about in, in the maturity, spiritual maturity. They might not, might, might not grow, you know, the way you like. Or you might, you might preach on something, but you see the same problem again in the church. Well, you've got to be patient. You've got to be patient with people and, and teach and, and uh, you know, yeah, edify the, the brethren. Now, I just wanted to finish up on covetous. Covetous. Because it said there, in, uh, not covetous. All right, not covetous. So obviously someone that's covetous is someone that has a strong desire for possessions or a desire for things that other people have, okay? It's kind of like being um, envious. It's very similar to, 
to coveting things, a strong desire for possessions. Now, I'll get you to turn to Luke chapter 12, please. Luke chapter 12. And we've gone through the book of Luke, so we've covered this a few times, but it's, always, it's, a, it's a good story anyway to read here. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, said unto Jesus, this is, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So this brother feels that his brother had cheated him, cheated him out of his inheritance somehow. Verse 14. And he said unto him, Man, who have made me a judge or divider of you? So this is what Jesus is warning this person from. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. You see, the covetous finds value, finds satisfaction, finds, you know, uh, importance in the things that he owns, the things that he has. You know, that's why they go off and buy the huge houses and, 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 the, and the nice sports cars. It's because they think that represents who they are. You know, it gives them value in life. But that's not what a pastor should be like. You know, be happy with your, your beat-up Corolla, whatever, whatever you've got, you know. That, that van that I've got is not very fancy, but it gets my family around, right? You, you, you can't covet, you know, nice, you know, or fancy things. Look, if God gives you things, that's fine. You know, but you shouldn't be, have that strong desire for, for worldly possessions. Look at verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he said within himself, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. This, this man is wealthy. This man has in abundance. God has blessed him with more than he needs. You know, and if he has more than he needs, what should he do? He should give to those without. You know, he should, should, should show love to maybe family members, maybe church brethren that have a need. Hey, I've got abundance. Let me give you a blessing. You know, let me give you this gift. Let me a blessing in your life. But is, is it that way? No. What does it say? Verse 18, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I, I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, the bishop's goal is not to become rich for himself, but to become rich, to be rich toward God, to lay up his treasures in heaven, you know? And here's the thing. My desire is that you would lay up treasures in heaven, you know? That's where it matters, eternal value. But if you see me chasing after money, chasing after possessions, do you think that's going to encourage you to seek heavenly gifts? But if, if you see me, you know, chasing after money, these things, you're probably going to be like, well, if pastors after that, then I should be after that. You know, and I can destroy an entire church instead of laying up beautiful treasures in heaven that last forever. You're focused on the material wealth in this life and making yourself rich here. You know, as, as a pastor, you've got to set the example. All right? You've got, you got to set the example. You've got to lay up your treasures up in heaven so people know that's important. That's, if that's important for the pastor, surely that's important for me. You know, I've got to lay up treasures up in heaven as well. Not being covetous. Please go to... Um, 2 Peter chapter 2 now. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Sorry, it's a little long tonight. 2 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 7 verse 7. Now we often think about the, the, the material wealth with covetousness, but it's more than that. Okay, it's more than that. Romans 7 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So what does the Bible compare covetousness with or coveting? As lusting, having, having lust, okay? See, the word lust is the noun form of the verb covet, kind of like faith and believe. Faith is a noun form for the word believe. Believe is a verb, okay? So coveting, coveting something is to lust over something, all right? And there we saw in 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 1 very quickly, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, 
even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon them, themselves swift destruction. Drop down to verse 14. Speaking of the same people, these false prophets, these false teachers, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. Look, they cannot cease from sin. They've been given over to their lusts. It says, beguiling unstable souls and, um, and in heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. All right? We see what these false prophets are. Okay? We need to be careful. I do, I do not want to, I mean, I would be so distraught if I ever ordained a man who was a false prophet, a false teacher, someone who's filled with covetousness and lust. You know, what did it say there in verse 14 again? Having eyes full of adultery. What are they chasing after? They, 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 they want to commit fornication. They want to take, and this is what we saw in, in this book that I was reading, these pastors that take other men's wives, you know, deacons, wives, people, you know, wives of the church, you know. They, they take advantage. They find out that there's a, you know, a marriage breakup or, or uh, you know, a, a marriage is, is in problems. They, they, they come in and provide counsel. But then before you know it, they're with that woman, you know, and, and making, having their way with, with that person. Destroying the souls of the sheep that God has given them. Covetous. You know, this is why it's so important. Before we read this verse, in the previous verse, we already covered this, but the husband of one wife. You know, if you cannot control yourself with one wife, you've got a problem of lust. You've got a problem of covetousness. Okay, now, it's a different thing if your wife has passed away. Totally different, right? But you know what? A, a pastor... You know, if you've got a broken home, if you've got a damaged marriage, you're not suited to be a pastor, okay? You're not suited because, you see, you've got to maintain that physical intimacy with your wife. If you maintain that physical intimacy with your wife, you're not going to be necessarily chasing after something else. But see, it's not just the physical. It's also the emotional, okay? The emotional love, the emotional necessity between husband and wife. Now, it's one thing to have that physical need, but you should also have that emotional attraction to your wife. Because you might be fine with your wife physically, but then you might find yourself, you know, emotionally attached to some other woman that is not your wife. Okay? A, a pastor cannot be this way. A bishop must find fulfillment physically with his wife, but also emotionally. Okay? Emotionally. Otherwise, you can easily fall into the trap of lust, coveting other women that are not your wife, fall into major sin. And we see this happening with pastors. And this is why... I do not want to be overly busy as a pastor. I don't want to have activities every day of the week. And I want to keep things simple because I want to make sure that I get home, I spend time with my wife. I get home, I spend time with my children. They know who dad is. You know, they don't grow up thinking, well, dad cared about every other family in the church except for us. No, you know. And it's important for you to have that relationship with your wife to be ordained, but to maintain your ordination. You know, to, to not become disqualified, you've got to be able to keep that for the rest of your life, okay? Serious business, serious things. You can fall and become like these false prophets, these false... And that's what, that's what these guys are after. They, they take on positions of leadership within churches to take advantage of their devious sexual perversions that they have in mind. Little children, reprobates. These people are reprobates, but they sneak into our church, okay? We've got to be careful. We need to be aware of this. This is why one of, my, one of my minimum requirements, remember I said to you guys, it's not just that you prove yourself to me, but that the whole church is in agreement. Okay, because there, there could be someone in the church that knows of some perversion in your life that's been kept secret, you know. And if, if the, the entire church is not on board with ordaining that person, I don't want to ordain them, okay. I don't want to ordain them because they, they, could, they could very well be a false prophet. 